It's Thursday, 27th of May 2010, and this is the first proper edition of Transport Evolved. <laughs> Good morning, good afternoon, good evening and welcome. My name is Nikki Gordon-Bloomfield. And my name is Michael Boxwell. And this is the first proper edition of Transport Evolved, the new show that aims to tell you everything there is to know about the very latest news in green transport. It's the best way of describing it, isn't it, Mike? Absolutely, yes. We're covering electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles and all sorts of other stuff as well. And no doubt we're going to have some great guests uh some of whom are from the electric vehicle world in fact two the two guests we have today have a feet have feet firmly in the electric vehicle world mike keeps disappearing you all right there mike i'm still here yeah yeah your video keeps vanishing i don't know i know you had trouble with your internet okay. connection it's the time of day let's go ahead and introduce our guests for today first up my, well i i guess you could call him my boss which is kind of bizarre, really. Over hey, at High hey. Gear Media. <laughs> Mr. John Volker, how are you today? I'm good. Happy to be with you and congrats on the launch of the show. Thank you very much. We, we had to have you on the first show because, uh, you know, you, you're the go to guy these days for, well, certainly for me, for, for all things green. And uh, your, your research capabilities knows no bounds. And you always seem to get to a story before I do, which. Still can't quite get my head around, but there we are. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what have you been up to this, this week, John? Um, well, I actually have a non-electric test vehicle about which we shall not speak. Um, and last week I was actually driving a Bentley about which we definitely shouldn't speak because although highly ungreen, it was actually sort of fun. But um, some of the news stories that I've been following, I suspect we'll be talking about on today's show, Lots Absolutely. of partnering up in the EV world as I think the manufacturers, uh, real car makers, take EVs increasingly seriously and they recognize that it's expensive, it's challenging, it's difficult, it takes a long time, but they've got to be there, which I think is sort of very good for the world of green transport. Green transport in general has been just ablaze this week with so much going on. Um, Mike, at the end of the show, we've got an exclusive report that you managed to tag and bag, I suppose. That's right. With uh, Keith yep. Johnson, who's the That's right. uh, European manager of Reva. Yeah, he's a European president of, of Reva. Of course, a lot, lots of things have been going on in the world of Reva this week. So uh, with, with, with lots more money going into the company and, and, and a new majority ownership in there. So, uh, yeah, I managed to get... Uh, a, 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 an exclusive interview with with Keith Johnson, which was definitely worth listening to. Fantastic. Well, let's go ahead and introduce our second guest. He's got up at the butt crack of the American West Coast dawn. At least, certainly, I think it is for him. You're not a morning person, are you? Let's introduce Mark Geller. How are you? Good morning. Are you a morning, morning person, all. Mark? Not especially. No. But, but I'm you, learning to be. You've got up just especially <laughs> to be with us on this very first edition. And what a crew. We've got you and John and, and, and Mike and myself. So hopefully we'll have lots of fun. Now, you drive a RAV4 electric vehicle, RAV4 EV. How many miles have you got on that now? Uh, a little over 78,000. Wow. That's impressive. So 78,000 miles on right. a 2002, essentially eight-year-old car using 15-year-old technology. Still goes over 100 miles on a charge quite comfortably. In fact, right. uh, just earlier this week, drove up to Sacramento, 90 miles away, to go right. to a legislative hearing about electric mm -hmm. vehicles and was fully charged by the time the hearing was over and comfortably drove home. Well, there you so go. it was essentially a 190-mile day in a 100-mile car. In a 100 that's, car, 100 miles. That's not bad, really, is it? Really, 
That's pretty good going. Pretty good going indeed. So uh, what should we start with this week? There's been so much news. Well, I suppose let, let's start with the, the news. Let's go back in time to the start of the week. And it, we just missed this on last week's show, didn't we, Mike? Uh, something mm. big has been happening with Toyota and yes. Tesla. And I don't know about you, but I didn't see that one coming. Did, did anybody else see that coming? Not at all. I think it's, I think part of the surprise came from the fact that Toyota are traditionally very, um, very internal. Pretty much everything that they've done in the electric drive world has been done in-house by their own engineers. And obviously both for the nickel metal hydride batteries, which they have a joint venture with Panasonic for, and now lithium batteries, mm -hmm. which they essentially picked the wrong chemistry for initially. They've done it uh, either with Japanese partners or internally. They now have their own lithium battery lab. So for them to partner with a non-Japanese company, a new company, a venture-funded startup company, um, is quite unusual indeed. I, I just, I just, I don't, I don't know how they managed to keep it quiet. That's the thing that I'm shocked about because uh, the 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 car industry has ears, and there's <laughs> normally does, someone so, somewhere that will tip quite... off somebody that something is happening that someone will pick up at the end of the day, you know. But but in this case, nothing, nothing until it happens. Well. From what I read, it sounds like this was pretty much a two-man deal. Um, Mr. Toyota uh, sat down with Elon Musk of Tesla, and it sounds like they pretty much hammered it out together. Tesla had been expected to announce that they were going to pick <clears throat> one of two plants in Southern California to build the Model S, which they've already been funded by the DOE for. Yeah. And, you know, everybody was sort of tapping their fingers and saying, you've got to announce this plant already. Um, it does sort of solve a problem for Tesla in that NUMI in Fremont, California, is at least an existing car plant. Um, if they choose to pick up uh, or offer to rehire some of the UAW folks who were building Toyotas and Pontiacs there, those folks at least know how to build automobiles, which may give them a bit of a head start over taking some kind of other factory and training staff who've never done that before. I can also argue the other side of that, but um, it's clever. I mean, it solves the problem for Toyota in politically because they were getting hammered. And I don't know, Mark, can you talk more about local reaction to the closing of Numi? Oh, I mean, the, the closing of Numi was a, a, a big deal. There have been, you know, numerous stories. It's uh, people have been looking for ways to reinvigorate NUMI, whether with automotive or something else, for quite a while. I'm sorry about the garbage truck that's about to pass by here. Um, They're doing this. I think people are very. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but, uh, you know, there was a, a lot of excitement generated locally about this. People in Fremont, you know, including uh, public officials, elected officials, you know, kind of woke up to this announcement unbeknownst to themselves. I think we should probably take uh, Musk and Toyota uh, at their word that they basically did, as John said, hammer this out themselves. And I think Toyota, as they said, took a cue both from, in a sense, Tesla and Nissan um, by doing something quickly. I mean, Toyota said one of the things that most impresses them about Tesla is that as a smaller company, they're able to move quickly about things. And I think these guys decided they needed to move quickly. They needed to, as John said, have some political cover for the disastrous right. last few months. And um, mm -hmm. I think they also have to deal with Nissan. They have to deal with the fact that, you know, Ghosn, Carlos Ghosn, the head of the Nissan Renault Alliance, had sort of a come to Jesus moment where he, uh, you know, had this epiphany about uh, electric cars. And I think Toyota has to be wondering if their gamble that a all hybrid fleet uh, without plugs uh, was going to get them through the next generation of vehicles. And I think they're, they're dealing with that question and wanted a way somewhat 
off, uh, you know, outside of the normal channels of, of Toyota to pursue, uh, obviously, their tremendous skill set in plug-in mm-hmm. vehicles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Toyota, Toyota recognized that they've pretty much fallen behind. Um, I had written about this, but I finally got a chance to drive the Toyota Prius plug-in hybrid, of which they, they're going to issue four, five or 600 copies worldwide for testing right. before they launch it as a consumer product in probably in the early part of 2012. And, you know, in some ways... Clearly, Toyota have made more hybrids than anyone else, but, you know, the 2010 Prius is a modern car, but the third-gen Prius was essentially a refreshing of the 2004 model as opposed to something radically new. 2004, really, I mean, I remember the auto shows. People's jaws just dropped. They looked at this thing, and, you know, it was different looking to anything else. It had a ton of interesting things. You know, the 2010 is not that car. It's a very nice evolution. The Prius plug-in hybrid, I was sort of startled. You plug the battery in at night, right, or whenever, you get up to 12 miles of charge once, and then it reverts to being an absolutely standard hybrid. You can't use Regen to recharge the added part of the battery pack. So it's kind of a, to me, I was... When it, it took me a long time to understand that because it seemed like missing the point. Um, I wonder if Toyota are sort of fearful of falling behind in the next generation simply because they pioneered hybrids and have committed more than any other manufacturer to them, and they're so stuck on their existing path that they suddenly are afraid of being leapfrogged. There is another thing going on here as well. I mean, Toyota has always been a very private company. Trying to actually get information about what's coming up in the future and everything else, it, it's it's very much a controlled uh, set of information. They'll, they'll tell you what they want you to know and nothing more. Uh, but what we've seen in the last couple of years is, uh, you know, uh, Toyota CEO, uh, you know, Toyota, what a great name for a CEO of Toyota, um, it, it has been... Uh, rumored to be brokering a lot of these sort of deals on a one-to-one basis. So you've got this Tesla one, which is rumored to have been, um, you know, mainly at the hands of, of uh, Toyota CEO. Had another example of that last year with Aston Martin and Toyota with the the, the Aston Martin Signet based on the Toyota IQ. Again, it put together very very quickly. You know, a, a couple of meetings, literally over uh, over a few hours. Uh, rumored last year, and uh, you know, the whole system, everything goes goes ahead very very quickly. So I'm wondering if we're seeing a Something very different from Toyota, a little bit more risk taking, a little bit more innovation to uh, to try and stay ahead and to try and keep their their, their hands in uh, all these different uh, technologies and all these different opportunities that there are out there. I think I, I think that's right, and on. I think the the safety issues have really sort of exposed that there's something gone fundamentally wrong with Toyota's management culture um, here in the states. What's starting to come out is that the U.S. executives were deeply frustrated and kept sort of saying, you know, look, we need to pay attention to these things, Um, whereas they were being directed basically to downplay it, to save money, not to do the most expansive recalls, et cetera, et cetera. Um, You know, I I don't know forensically really if we'll ever know what happened inside the company, but there's certainly a great deal of frustration there at all levels, and something went went radically wrong. This kind of deal, you know, and Toyota is a descendant of the family that founded the company, so he's got as much on the line as, you know, Bill Ford or anybody else. Um, this kind of deal may be an, an attempt from the top down to sort of shake things up and really point out that you can't ossify into this, into this sort of cautious reactionary management style. Anyway... Let, let's examine what what the the message from Toyota had been up to that up to the point last week where we didn't know that this was public. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's yeah, it's a, a, a good way to address it trouble, because I think that yeah, I mean they've obviously been in a lot of trouble, and I think that you know uh, John was just talking about uh, driving the plug-in Prius that. Toyota is going to be making a few hundred of for test fleets. Um, and I think that is the Toyota from before. 
In other words, John described a vehicle that you would have to say technologically, you go, why would Toyota even bother? Um, mm. Not because of the 12 miles all electric range. I'm, I'm not particularly set on a particular amount of all electric range. Um, I think the important point is that you can plug it in. But to make a car where they just don't even bother making it so that the, 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 the regen can uh, affect the traction pack, um, the sort of additional pack, which I think is what John is describing, um, right. just makes no sense. I mean, I mean, it's as if trying to say, you know, the, the, the technology that we pursued 15 years ago, um, you know, and gave the all electric car an extra 10 or 15 percent range um, isn't worth enabling here. Right. <laughs> and you have to wonder why, you know, if it just was a cost saving and they know they you know, had no pathway um, at the moment for a plug in vehicle and that this was a really an attempt to sort of get people off their back about the whole plug-in issue while they watched what they presumed would happen, which would be that plug-ins would die on the vine. And, you know, of all of, when I finally sort of hammered away at them, um, the answer that came out as to why did you not provide the ability to recharge your traction pack was, well, you know, the relays aren't designed for high-frequency use, you know, and it's like, if any company in the world has experience designing robust, inexpensive electric machinery for electric drive cars, who else but Toyota, for God's sake? I just, I sort of gaped at that, and we all sat around and looked at each other, and then we moved on. But, you know, it makes no sense. <laughs> and I just, I scratch my head over that whole effort. On the other hand, I mean, they probably figured that they were going wrong a couple of years ago when they found out that their particular lithium-ion chemistry was, um, had, had greater power density but was essentially so difficult to manufacture that they were never going to be able to make it economical. Mm. That was when Toyota set up its own battery lab internally, not just with Panasonic, started researching different chemistries, so the plug-in that I drove may, in fact, be sort of the last branch on a dead evolutionary limb on their tree. And, you know, the Prius plug-in that we see may actually be quite different. But it just does speak to the fact, even if they've announced the little, you know, an electric version of the IQ to go into production in 2012 or something, an electric IQ, just like an electric smart, is not particularly relevant, at least to the U.S. market. It may be more useful for city centers in Europe and Asia, but, um, you know, it's way too small. And until I hear that Toyota are doing essentially a leaf size electric vehicle, it's hard to take it seriously. I just want to add something to, to the whole kind of plug-in Prius that you can't recharge, which is that I had a plug-in Prius, which I converted myself. And yeah, Mike, Mike teases me regularly about the fate of that car. It, it ended up uh, non-functioning again, didn't it, Mike? But you, you cook, you cooked it. I yes. cooked it because I didn't use uh, <laughs> proper recharge uh, safeties. But I could recharge my all three of my batteries. And, and, and technically, from what I understand from from what John and other people have told me, essentially the the, the plug-in Prius that they're they're testing at the moment is a regular Prius with with an extra battery pack, or is it two extra battery mm. packs? Two extra, yeah. Yeah, which is what mine was, and and had. Pretty much, it sounds like a similar range, except mine could recharge while it was moving. Um, a fail, epic fail. But you, you mentioned the leaf, so let's go on to the leaf. Mike, what's been going on this week with the leaf? Well, obviously, the, um, uh, you know, the, the Nissan Leafs it appears to have been selling extremely well in the United States. Uh, they announced that 13,000 people have put down $99 deposits for their car. Uh, 6,000 people in Japan have also put down deposits for their car. Uh, and there's going to be uh, the the order books are opening in Europe very very soon. Uh, we we hear it's sort of end of June, early July. So we'll see what what comes out over here as well. Um, I've been on a lot of the Nissan Leaf forums, which have sprung up over the last couple of months, and finding out what people have been thinking and and so on and so forth. And uh, also to find out how serious people are about these Nissan Leafs, and it, you know there are very very dedicated people there who uh, really love the idea of owning an electric car. Nissan have played the ultimate. Uh, PR game, I think. 
a, 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 Nissan have come under a lot mm. of criticism from electric car. What can what should we call them? Polite name for them. I don't want to call them advocates because that's horrible too. Those who are advocates, I don't want to call them nuts because that's offensive. Religious zealots. No, no, no. no. <laughs> there, there are a specific group of of electric vehicle supporters who mm. are have been really on Nissan's case for for not uh, just giving the car out to any Tom, Dick, and Sally who happens to want one. And there's been this mm. page long, as I understand it, questionnaire that, that you have to fill out to say what you're going to do to it. That hasn't put people off. Um, and I have to, I have to, no, it has. I have to credit uh, Chelsea Sexton with, with you know, coming up with this, this idea that uh, you, that you don't buy a gadget, you don't buy a house, or you don't buy any any big ticket item normally without someone checking that it's okay for what you want it to be used for. Um. And it seems mm. to have worked in Nissan's favour on this one. The other thing is that Nissan have created such hype about this uh, vehicle that they've almost guaranteed a success for the next three years, provided there is no catastrophic failure in the cars, there's no major safety recalls, and there's uh, no issues with fulfilment of orders. I think those are the three things that stand between the leaf being a success and a failure now. What, what does everyone if I else could think? Put a, John? If I could put on my, um, my industry analyst hat for a minute, because as sure. you know, I also do these market analyses. Um, I never had any doubt that the first two to three years worth of electric vehicle production, including the Volt uh, plug-in, or the Volt extended range and so forth, I never had any mm -hmm. doubt that those will be snapped up. You know, uh, there are a lot of people in North America, it's a large market, there are a lot of early adopters, and exactly the same people who bought the first Priuses are likely to buy these cars. I think the challenge comes, you know, and if 13,000 is the first year's alloc is next year's allocation for Nissan Leafs in the U.S., that adds to about eight or 10,000 Chevrolet Volts. Right. Um, Coda say 14,000, but most people don't take that terribly seriously. But, you know, let's, let's give them 10,000 too. We're talking about 30,000 cars. That's not that many. Um, the right. challenge is going to come in 2014 and beyond. You know, Nissan have said they want to make half a million Leafs for 2012 um, yeah. or yeah. the 2013. 13, 2013, but, you know, yeah. 2013, that's a lot. Um, and I think the question becomes, yes, there are going to be a fair number of people in North America who buy a LEAF as a second or third car, understand the limited duty cycle, have other vehicles to fill in. I think it's a little bit more problematic in Europe and Asia where there are fewer multi-car households, so it may have to serve as a primary vehicle more of the time. On the other hand, average trip lengths are shorter in Europe and Asia. But the question is, yes, you can sell a little bit of everything, as we found out with smarts in the U.S. Will it last? Will people have a good experience? Will they become uh, essentially, uh, what's the word, not proselytizers? What did Guy Kawasaki used to be called? Evangelists. Right. Um, Evangelists. For the Leaf and the Volt and so forth. Or will everybody who wants a compact 100-mile range electric vehicle get one and then you start to plateau. And that's what I'm seeing amongst other industry analysts. People with Nissan's announcement and, and the general level of enthusiasm, we're now starting to get, okay, fine, well, you know, 2011 and 2012, they'll sell out, that's fine. But they're not going to be able to sell. Da, 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 da. Um, I do believe that pure electric vehicles in 2020, 10 model years from now, are still only going to be 1% or 2% of global production. I don't think they'll be 10%. You know, 10% of global production 10 years from now is 8 million vehicles. Right. That's a lot of electric cars. It's a lot. It's right. a lot. And there was an it is, but uh, yeah. a lot of that will depend also on the way electric cars are marketed and, and promoted and everything else. I mean, uh, John, you and I have had a, a discussion before. What if electric cars were given away free of charge? The same way as you get your mm -hmm. mobile phone free of charge and you sign up for a tariff. 
if if electric cars were sold in the same sort of way, you get your car free of charge, and you then pay, you know, two hundred dollars a month or whatever for the, the, a mileage allowance. But all your servicing costs and everything else are built into that. If two hundred dollars is less than you're paying already for for, for gasoline, let's re- don't forget the gasoline prices will only ever go up. Then effectively, you're getting a free car. And if you've got that sort of marketing going on, you could easily get the stage instead of people saying, "Why do I want an electric car?" People are going to be thinking, "Why do I want anything other than an electric car?" And at that point, you well, potentially you end up with a very big game changer. Got... So you could. Sorry, a bit of a lag there. Oh, uh, as you and I also discussed, <laughs> I don't think the analogy works exactly because the proportion of the running costs, whether it's gasoline or right. kilowatts or you know voice minutes on your mobile phone, to the price of the hardware, is quite different for a vehicle. I think when we ran the rough numbers, it works when you get gasoline at sort of the 8 to $12 a gallon phase. But in North America, we're mm-hmm. a very long way from that. And absent yeah. some kind of catastrophic geopolitical or environmental event, it's li- gasoline is likely to stay under $5 a gallon in this country for at least the next few years. Cool. And, and deep, we'll deep water horizon in, the, is in Europe. That's not that? quite the, in Europe, that's not quite the same case because if you look at something like the United United Kingdom, gas prices now are at just over seven dollars for for a US gallon, and they've been going up. Uh, this so far this year, they've been going up by by about eight uh, percent from January till now. So it, we're not far off that sort of level. So it, you're right. For America, it's going to take a little bit longer, but in in Europe, it could happen. It really could it, happen. It's, yep. It's a, it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, point though. I mean that that there is a very it is a very small proportion of cars predicted to be electric by well, the end of twenty twelve. Yes, of course. Um, I mean, but I think you know. I mean, the question becomes really. I mean, you know, maybe we should be looking back on these analysts, uh, present company accepted um, uh, predictions in the past and uh, analyses <laughs> in the past. And I see a lot of these analyses and have seen them for the past ten years on on uh, the prospect for various technologies and, you know, the preeminent uh, body in California, the Air Resources Board, you know, is touting uh, their projections for, you know, how in 2040, uh, 75% of the vehicles sold will be fuel cell vehicles and a small percentage will be battery electric vehicles because that's the sort of ideological Kool-Aid that they've bought. And the truth is none of us really have uh, the ability to project certainly that far out. And the question becomes, can we project out? I mean, we, we know something about manufacturing capability, but can we project out what happens when a radically different technology um, that meets different and uh, sort of almost unquantifiable needs of consumers uh, and something they had been really in the dark about before, um, or at least the electric car was not really any different from, say, a flying car in terms of uh, how close to uh, the marketplace it had been. And what happens when everyone has a neighbor or a friend of a friend who's got an electric car and uh, the you know, downward price, price pressure that's happening and that will happen um, and the, what perhaps will be a more aggressive stance by governments over time uh, you just made reference to the uh, uh, oil devastation in the Gulf. Um, yeah. You know, that's not the last, uh, not the first and not the last time something like that happens. The question is, um, you know, John suggested perhaps we need, uh, in order to get over the valley of death for the technology, some sort of, uh, you know, either environmental catastrophe or geopolitical catastrophe. And I would make the case that those things are actually going on right now. The question is whether they're focused yeah. upon uh but, but clearly they are today, and no one I've seen discussing the Gulf said, you know, holy geez, uh, you know, if there were electric cars in the world, this might yeah. become less of an issue. But I think that if there are electric cars on the market, um, and you've got the Gulf tragedy going on, and you get to buy your next car and participate in that destruction or not participate in that destruction, yeah. uh, we just can't, we can't really yet grok how the paradigm will shift and how quickly. I would agree with that. And I would say the intersection of sort of consumer desires and that far out, sort of past 2020, 
government long-term direction, tax policies, you know, infrastructure investment, things like that, come much more into play. Um, so, yeah, it gets very fuzzy. I would say, though, that for all that electric cars are <coughs> sort of one of the bigger evolutions in a century, practical electric cars, at least in evolved markets like Europe and North America, where people are not suddenly going to double or triple the number of vehicles on the road, unlike China, um, they're going to do mm. essentially the same things that regular cars do now. It's not like a personal computer or the right. Internet or a mobile phone or a, an iPad where an entirely new universe of opportunities opens up to you that you had no way of accessing before. Your Nissan Leaf is still going to carry the kids to the football game and get groceries and take you to the train station yeah. and whatnot. Yeah, you, you got a you got a very valid point there. Um, there was something that that came by in that just in that little exchange there that I just wanted to add in. We're talking about governmental support, and I just it's just a little snippet of news that I want to drop in. But when Nissan said they were going to, uh, they announced the Leaf in the UK and in Europe. One of the things, excuse me, one of the things that they, they, they said was that the reason they were choosing uh, England as, as one of the prime markets was because of governmental support for the purchase of electric vehicles. Uh, sadly, I don't know if, if uh, anybody else has heard this, there's a rumour, and it is just a rumour at the moment, I think, that the new coalition government in the UK, obviously Britain is in a large amount of debt and it's gradually growing uh, not really gradually, it's growing quite quickly day by day. Uh, the new Conservative and Liberal Democrat coalition uh, that's running the country has said that it might rescind the £5,000 grants available, which were due to start in January next year for people wanting to buy an electric car. Um, if that happens, I suspect it will be almost a suicide for the electric car industry, um, or maybe genocide would be a better term. Whereas on this side of the I don't farm, know, because um, I mean... They, they... Carry on, John. Okay. Oh, sorry, Mike. Um, I was just going to say um, there are news in this morning's uh, feeds that um, there's a bill to be introduced in the House this morning to provide $11 billion worth of infrastructure money to a selected set of communities to make them plug-in ready. Um, this is apparently new funding on top of the existing infrastructure. The idea is to choose, it sounds like, a dozen or so communities and wire them up so that they have all of these public recharging points, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right. presumably with some... Are you talking about the states or in England? England? In the states. It's okay. Check this morning's Detroit News. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think that sounds like the Electrification Coalition. Yes. Oh, right. Of course, yes. You know, uh, yeah. And, and they've been talking about uh, a plan like that. Right. Um, it, it, it's it's yeah. going to be turned into a bill and introduced. Whether it'll pass, who knows? It, it is. Um, yeah. Or even whether it's the right strategy. <laughs> yeah. The, the right That's strategy. Its own show, I suspect. Well, one of the problems with any new technology is accessibility, isn't it, uh, to the general public? And, and I mean, the iPad was mentioned earlier on in today's show. It's an extremely sexy piece of computer equipment. I, I think so. It's it's very nice device and it is going to revolutionize personal computing in its own little way. Agreed. But it's far beyond the bounds of most consumers. You know, it's it's what is six hundred dollars <coughs> ticket price? That's pretty cheap. I didn't. I mean, I'm not Isn't saying that everybody why can buy it. Credit cards were invented, Nikki. <laughs> 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 I've been having still a discussion with my wife all day today. She's buying one tomorrow, apparently, on the on the company expenses because <laughs> uh, she's writing out iPhone apps <laughs> and iPad apps, so we can justify it. But uh, I, but I think a lot of people, you know, look at that and go, "Well, I can't afford to spend that. I can buy." A netbook computer for for two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars that does pretty much the same thing, and I think uh, I think people are going to look at electric cars and hybrids and fuel cells and other 
forms of alternative energy vehicles as being a, a social ladder that they cannot climb. Well, oh, I think this. Let's no, be real. Think, That's let's how look at this. The realist always gets introduced. Look at the first high definition televisions. They cost yeah. eight thousand dollars. Look at the electric yeah. self starter that actually let the gasoline yeah. engine dominate. That came in on Cadillacs first. Yep. Yeah. yeah, you got a point there. Yeah, yeah. and, no, and you, it, yeah. it's true. And think, also, if you're going to have a, a an industry which is absolutely reliant on government handouts just to make it viable. It's not viable, is it? Yeah. It's got to get to the stage where uh, these these cars can be sold at a price that people can afford. Now that means, in the first place, then you know, instead of these small city cars and everything else, maybe the electric car manufacturers should be looking at sports cars, like the Tesla, like the for Tesla, instance, yeah. and the high ticket items where people uh, where they can make money. The, the, the people the the cars are expensive because what you know what they are. It makes them sexy. It makes them exciting, which means that more and more people want electric cars. Yeah. And so, as the production prices start coming down, then you're, you know, you, you've got a, a viable future for the electric vehicle industry. Maybe that's a better solution. Well, uh, and also, you know, for companies like Riva who can build cars at a competitive price to gasoline cars, you know, the the you know the NXR, a similar sort of price to a a, a Fiat 500 and the like, then you know, why penalise them by giving everyone else a, 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 everyone else a discounts? I think I think also I should probably point out that you know I said the iPad was expensive. Apple has today, or I think it was yesterday, become more worth more than microsoft the company's net worth is wow. now more than microsoft yeah i was gonna so, i was gonna point out that you know for everything that we said about uh or, or you said about the ipad being kind of out of people's reach um has been said about for example every product that apple has yeah. ever made yep. um it was meant to lead to the end of the company it got bailed out in fact by microsoft 10 years ago um and i would say has proven that it has come out of sort of reliance on other companies, yeah. equivalent perhaps to uh, government incentives, and is now, you know, on top of the world. Yeah. Even uh, while maintaining, you know, what eight or nine percent market share in computers. So let let's look at let's look at the future now. If we take someone like Apple, and when we 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 move that forwards from you know ten years ago when when uh, you know Steve Jobs was was on stage and saying, well, you know, we think Microsoft Internet Explorer is the best thing since sliced bread, and I use it. And you know, Microsoft has signed a deal with us to continue producing Office for Mac. Um, and now where they're at. Where do you think in t sort of five to ten years' time the alliances that have formed, the new alliances that are formed with the alternative fuel vehicles um, are going to be? We've got this incestuous web now in the auto industry. I'm trying to, I'm trying to work out if, if, I st if I name a car company, can we get back to Tesla? You know, if I said, I mean, there's an e let's start with an easy one. Uh... Well, obviously, we've got Toyota uh, and and Tesla. You go one step back. Back, you can go Renault. Renault worked with Daimler, or are working with Daimler. Daimler have worked or are working with Tesla. Tesla are now working with Toyota. It can get bigger, can't it? I'm just trying to think how many links you can have an association. Link. The auto Is trade it? magazines often do these gigantic spread page diagram of yeah. all of the different deals and relationships. And I, I think the point here is that new powertrain technologies, let alone battery energy storage, are phenomenally expensive. Oh. That was the reason that um, GM partnered up with then Daimler Chrysler and BMW hopped in a few months later to work on the two mode to get experience jointly across the four companies. And, you know, a, a mid-sized company like BMW understands it can't afford to do both its own battery electric vehicles and its own hybrids. You know, mm. BMW are a large company, yeah. and they sell, they actually sell more cars in the States now than does Mercedes-Benz. But um, they can't, they just don't have the capital to do that. So they're partnering with Daimler on their hybrids while going it alone on battery electric vehicles. And you see a lot of these these little sorts of partnerships or big partnerships. Um, GM and Ford, if I remember, jointly developed a six-speed automatic transmission. You know, because that's, by the time you're all said and done, if you're going to produce uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of those a year, that you get into the billions of dollars there. 
I think the question for me on a technical level is, what exactly is it that Tesla has to offer in that um, their current electric technology, um, their battery box, uses a very large number of inexpensive commodity lithium cells based on cobalt, which virtually no other car maker plans to use in the long run because it's rather more dangerous than some of the other chemistries. Right. Um, what is it Tesla's software? Is it their design approach? Have they got a generation two battery box that's completely different using much larger format lithium cells that's, you know, under wraps and that's what attracted Toyota? That's the, the head scratcher for me. Not only the cultural thing about Toyota going to this small company, which as we discussed was sort of two guys getting together and shaking hands, but what's the technical appeal? Maybe it's the uh, the lack of baggage. Yeah, I mean, it might not be technical, I mean, on the technical well. side. Let's remember. Carry on. Um, let's re- yeah, let's, let, let's remember, you know, I mean, Tesla, um, I'm sure they've made many contributions to their own vehicle. Um, but, you know, basically they started off with AC propulsion, as many people do, um, and go from there. They license AC propulsion <laughs> stuff. BMW is, is, had worked with, uh, had AC propulsion build the E-minis. Um, and what it may be is nothing really technical, though it's a nice place to put technical work on, on electric vehicles um, from the point of view of Toyota, a company that doesn't want to do it. Uh, but it's really more in the way of marketing. And a, in a sense, Tesla was there at the birth. Um, Tesla uh, is, is un, uh, yeah, un, unburdened with the baggage of 100 years of uh, petroleum petroleum dominance. They don't have the discussions inside Tesla as to how to balance out all the issues of being a legacy car maker, uh, burdened with all of the legacy problems. And that may just be a nice place to start fresh. Uh, And also, you know, the the links between Tesla are presumably smaller than the rest of the auto industry. There are fewer interconnections. Um, and unless I'm mistaken, Tesla have not done any dealings with any other Japanese firms, have they? John, am I, am I right there? I believe that's correct. They have the Daimler deal. Yeah, so the, the nearest connection they've got is through Renault and Daimler. Um, Honda, let's wonder where they're going and who they're going mm. to be involved with. This week, uh, UK journalists got to drive the CRZ um, hybrid sports car. Um, which, you know, if you go back to the 80s, uh, was a very popular car in standard, standard gas form. Um, yep. John, have you driven one? I have not. And as far as I'm aware, no North American journalist has yet. Um, right. Honda are now setting up drive events for late spring and early summer. But it's, you know, it's one of those cars that we're all very curious about because the specs don't look terribly promising. On the other hand, um, everybody loves their memories of this, of the two generations of CRX and is sort of hoping against hope that the thing will be fun and chuckable. So you don't really mind that the mileage is decent, but not stellar. And the performance is the same. Well, the C the CR, the CRX Del Sol still, Secondhand still uh, really commands a very high price here in the UK. It's Although to be fair, I don't Absolutely. consider the Del Sol a real CRX. It's funny because a lot of <laughs> a lot of people take the CRX and then uh, the Del Sols and then upgrade them and and it's the mods, it's the mod boys, it's the drift crowd. You know, it's it's yeah. it's it's that crowd that that get into it. But uh, Top Gear magazine said it's it's proper fun to drive. Uh, Honda may have finally Can I ask a question? Yeah. driving sexy. Mark, go on. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I have a question here. Um, is there any reason uh, on a certain level, other than sort of within the automotive press and analysis world, that we should continue to discuss hybrid cars outside of the realm of gasoline cars? Um, in other words, uh, if the car can't get any of its energy from, from electricity uh, or some other source, but electricity is really what we're talking about these days. Why, why should we be taking every time someone comes out with a hybrid version of something and put it through its paces and talk about it as if it's 
um, a different technology in a meaningful way um, would have a different Indeed, impact I upon please, the please. consumer. Go on, John. Yeah. You, you're burning for that. Let, let's get it um, going. I, I understand what you're saying, Mark. I think my answer is I want to distinguish between full hybrids and mild hybrids because full hybrids are the first way that a mass of consumers, a much larger mass of consumers than are going to be able to buy electric cars in the net or plug-in cars in the next three years, those full hybrids are the first little exposure to all electric drive. And my example here, as Nikki knows, is my mom. Um, for various reasons, my mom ended up with a Ford Escape hybrid. And right. I'm not allowed, she would shoot me if I said how old she was. She's a lady of a certain age. But <laughs> to my <laughs> shock, my mother has become a hypermiler. She and my dad compete as to who got the highest <laughs> instantaneous mileage reading on the trip to the grocery store. And she loves showing her friends how long she can drive in electric mode without switching on the engine. I, to say that this is a shock would be the understatement of the decade. Um, granted, she's married to an engineer, but still. Then the point here is that, <laughs> though that one mile in a Toyota Prius or whatever that someone drives in all electric mode is going to get people over the hump of the unfamiliarity and the fear and the golf cart image of electric cars. Mild hybrids like the CRZ, Great. Honda's whole program, don't fall into that because you don't have pure electric right. mode. And I think increasingly mild hybrids are a technological dead end because they're going to get squeezed by far more efficient, smaller, boosted, direct-injected gasoline engines on the bottom and falling prices for the hardware for full hybrid systems on the top. Ford, uh, uh, Nancy Joy at Ford actually said to me, they didn't even consider mild hybrids because their survey showed that consumers really value right. that electric mode, even if it's only for a mile. So I think the answer to Mark's question is, I understand the sort of statement of principle, but you're easing people into the consideration pool for electric cars by giving them some experience. I would say, uh, I would also add that with Honda, Honda are in a really strange place, which is why I came up with a question, because we, we did kind of go down a little bit of a rap run talking about it, but what what's next for Honda? Because Honda are still remaining very adamant that we don't want, we don't feel electric cars have a place in the market. We're, we're making a, an electric vehicle under duress so that we can sell it to the North American <laughs> market. Because if they don't come but remember, up with Honda are not a car company. Honda no. are a company that right. makes engines and things to contain them in. They always have been. <laughs> right. So yeah, I think that, 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 that is find me a car maker that makes that is, snowmobiles, chainsaws, portable generators. Yeah. Uh, you know, the list is endless. Honda make this phenomenal amount of stuff that have internal combustion engines in them. So do you think Some that, happen to be cars. I understand. You think that cars are 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 because oh. they they're, they're following the whole hydrogen thing uh with with blind obedience almost well they all say that i, th um, I think the one thing which my question honda regarding is, honda, um, go on mark my, my question about honda is it's you know i've been given uh to understand that you know they're a pretty serious player in the electric bike and electric scooter market and i don't know if to what extent that's actually true i was just having a conversation with someone recently but i think it is interesting if they are um, if, you know, if they're a player in Japan and China actually cranking out um, quality e-bikes and e-scooters, it suggests to me that they actually are creating a pathway to develop the proper technology in their own good time um, to move in that direction. Though I've, I, I've always largely subscribed to what John says, which is that, uh, you know, Honda is an internal combustion engine company and not a car company. Well, there you have it. There you have it. Uh, we should. Um, we, we're running out of time very quickly, Mike. So I think we should. We should go on to a couple other stories. Mm. Uh, let's talk about BYD encoder, and I'm going to try and combine them. Although, actually, talking about them in separation is is also a, a good idea because they are very different companies, very different vehicles. Coda is a a company that's producing the the Coda sedan. They've 
claim they want to to sell 14,000 electric cars in the US by the end of next year. Let's not forget, Nissan have just closed their order books for 13,000 Leafs for this year. Mm. So that is a very uh, uh, um, optimistic target, I think, for a car company that, it that have essentially only just started to produce vehicles or have uh, intent to produce vehicles. They have raised another 58 million in funds. Um, but there is some question as to whether their cars are US ready yet. Um, there was a report that said that they were, but this was from a Chinese newspaper talking to the company who produced the, uh, the, the glider, the, the version of the car that uh, is based upon a gas-powered car. The glider has apparently passed safety tests that would that the Chinese are saying is equivalent to the US safety tests. But we've, we've, we've had situations before, haven't we, John, where, where someone said that and it's not actually been <clears> the <throat> case, where, where the, the wording of the quote is, it's passed safety tests appropriate to the US rather than it has passed US safety tests. Um, Coda are an interesting company. We don't really have the time to go in here, but I would only say or point out their engineering consultant from fairly early on has been Porsche, which has its own consultancy on automotive yeah. design. Um, and I, that fact alone and the fact that Porsche in due course let them say that Porsche were actually consulting for them yeah. makes me take Coda somewhat more seriously. Um, the initial product, I think, you know, I think 15,000 is wildly aggressive. Yeah. Um, there are no Coda dealers. They're only selling in California. They are vetting their buyers even more thoroughly. Um, they're mm -hmm. actually quite open about, we're going to qualify the people who want to buy our car. Um, but I expect a large number of the Codas to go yeah. to municipal authorities and fleets, at least those ones that don't have Buy American provisions in them. Um, as opposed to Nissan, which is much more of a consumer product. BYD, on the other hand, is a little bit less proven. Uh, you know, everybody who talks about BYD has to put the asterisk about Warren Buffett invested in the company, which is fine. Um, but it's a bit unless like, or until... <laughs> yeah, it's a bit like being married to someone famous and being known because you're married to the famous person rather than being famous in your own right. It, it, exactly. And, it you know, until I... There. Until anyone I know drives and road tests a BYD E6 that has been certified by the NHTSA for sale in the U.S. And the same goes to Coda, but they're closer. I at least you know, drove uh, yeah, around I mean, in Coda a, a working least, vehicle. Coda have at least let people ride in a working vehicle. Mark, I have a suspicion you may have ridden in a Coda. Yes, I did. You? Yeah. And how was I it? I in a Coda. And well, it was per it was okay, you know. I mean, it, it reminded me. I mean, it's it was. Let's say it was it was better than a Selectria Force, but it had that's, a. Uh, that's, that's not a particularly good compat. That's not a really very good benchmark. <laughs> no, it, it, and I think partially it, it emotionally felt like that. Right. Um, so uh, more of a conversion. You know, we didn't get felt like a conversion. It was, it, 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 somewhat. I mean, and it was clearly you know the fit and finish was just you know, not there. And I've go, gotten used to, you know, a pretty high level fit and finish on, on electric, perspective electric cars. I mean, I drive, drove the Volt last week and, um, you know, that was a real car. Uh, yeah. There was no mistaking that you could take that car through its paces and that's why they, I mean, they didn't let us drive it for long enough, but, you know, you could floor it in this huge parking lot and get up some speed and take some wild turns and it felt like a car. Whereas I think if they had given us the coda and said do that, you just would have been afraid in a sense that the, uh, the fender might have fallen off. But, the, you know, I'm being more negative than I actually feel just because I feel like, um, I don't know what I feel like. But it's, it's uh, you know, I don't know enough about coda to know what's, what's going on with coda is, is how I feel. And it, their projections for 10 or 15,000 cars by the end of 2010 or in 2011 have always seemed wildly um, uh, optimistic. Um, and I've gotten a little tired of um, 
press releases in this area. And so I, though I, I really do give them uh, kudos for bringing the car around, uh, letting us uh, have a ride in it. Um, and clearly they've got a serious group of people attempting to do this. And I wish them every luck. I mean, I, I hope that they are ready to put cars in the market very soon. Uh, but I think that cars companies like Coda have got to have had, uh, GM as well for that matter, uh, you know, some serious discussions since Nissan announced the price of the Leaf. Because it means, you know, a Coda has to come in lower than a Leaf. And I think that is putting tremendous pressure on, on some of these companies. And I think it's putting pressure on GM as well in terms of pricing of the Volt. They're essentially playing roulette with each other. The difference is that Nissan don't have to bank, don't have to bet the entire bank on this. Right. And remember, despite Gohn's statements, I'm highly skeptical that Nissan are going to turn a profit on their first few years of lease. Oh, no, I don't expect them to. Is widely widely accepted to have put probably 10 or 15 billion dollars into the hybrid program before it even began to break even on a oh, yeah. sort of a marginal basis. Nissan has to do the same thing, probably. But I think Mark's exactly right in that that puts huge pressure on Coda, which doesn't have any other line of business to backstop it. Let's just finish up with a couple of very quick kind of stories that we want to just inject in that, that aren't electric, because uh, obviously transport evolves is about all forms of future transport that hopefully are slightly evolved. And uh, the question is whether you believe that the, the next stories are considered evolved or not. There's a rumour that uh, Daimler and Toyota are working on fuel cell development. So although Toyota are working with Tesla on this new electric drivetrain, they're still, they're still ticking away in the background on fuel cells. Um, and uh, I think most people have now come to a point where they've accepted that if there are advances in the way that hydrogen is generated and if it can be generated in a clean way, then, then yeah, it, it's a good potential fuel for the future, but, but it's still that if or when, how thing. And we hope to have someone on to talk about that at some point in the future. Uh, finally, um, LPG and, and CNG uh, is becoming quite popular. Uh, in in Europe these days, um, but uh, now it's it's becoming a little bit more uh, interesting because uh, I think this is one of your stories, uh, John, uh, over at Green Car Reports. Chevrolet Express and GMC Savannah vans are big vehicles, right? They're right. Huge. And but they're now going uh, to liquid petroleum and compressed natural gases to be run. W- why? What what's the advantage of this? Some Preserving fleet. the internal um, combustion engine. <laughs> Spoken well, like a tree, there a tree are EV advocate, Mark. Advent- In certain Miranda. markets, there are cost advantages. Uh, I mean, Honda just launched its Civic, C- or Civic GX into Utah um, because Utah actually has a fair bit of natural gas, and it's quite cheap there. It's this sort of localization of fuels thing um, mm. where... You know, we may see in urban areas more pure electric vehicles. We may see CNG for long-haul trucking and for places that have CNG nearby. We may see flex fuel and ethanol vehicles in places where it makes sense to produce it locally. Um, I think this diversity of fuels for combustion engines, along with diversity of powertrain types, is where we're going, just as we have diversity of body styles now. And I, and yeah, I think the there's, only there's, there's a, go on. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think there's something to be said for that. Um, and I think you're, you're spot on in terms of long haul trucking, where they've really got to figure out something in this country since the logical transition to rail is just not going to happen, um, or certainly not, not quickly enough. But I think that uh, as we always are quick to jump on electric uh, technologies for the uh, incentives and support that, they, uh, that we attempt to get from the government for it, Let's be clear, all of these other technologies, including CNG and biofuels, are at the moment completely dependent on government subsidies and tax structures that incentivize them, as well as local uh, authorities' uh, rules regarding alternative fuel vehicles. 
um, and the incentives that they get for it. I, I'm you know highly skeptical about how seriously uh, Honda is going to enter that market with uh, the the uh, G, GX. Um, I doubt it will be any more aggressively than than uh, in California. And I dare say that though urban areas are a special focus for electric cars because um, urban areas are likely to increasingly disallow uh, internal combustion cars, as they've done in some markets in Europe, I think that um, there's no special advantage ultimately in rural areas for natural gas, even if there happens to be a a lot of natural gas available in that state, because let's be clear, they are all electrified. We have, you know, since since Franklin Roosevelt, the country is electric. The Mm -hmm. infrastructure is uh, everywhere. Uh, and so there really aren't any inhibitions on uh, electric cars wherever in the country. Mark, it's not, a, it's not a distribution problem. You're entirely right there. It's more a duty cycle problem. Unless and until we get electric vehicles that have 300 plus miles of range, those of my friends who live in sparsely populated rural areas um, of the Midwest or other parts of North America easily knock off more than 100 miles a day, easily. And the, the point was more about duty cycles. You know, one of the points I try to hammer home on Green Car Reports is this business of we pick cars now, pick body styles, car sizes, and types based on what we're going to do with them. We will do the same thing with powertrains. So the electric car is fine if, in fact, you go 100 miles or less a day and have six hours to plug it in somewhere or some slight just- bit of that. I, I understand what you're saying, but I just want to say that is what the plug-in hybrid is for. And um, I would you know, strongly assert that we have two fuels, quote-unquote fuels, available to people everywhere. Yeah. Gasoline and perhaps diesel and electricity. And uh, hmm. to attempt to switch fuels um, is a bigger proposition, actually, than switching technology in the cars, since that's the direction that offers us so many environmental and political benefits, um, which you know just can't be said about any of the other alternative fuels. And so, to combine them, to offer those people who who more who quite often have 150 or 250 mile days, um, the option to do what still we must remember, even in Lodi, California, or or or, or somewhere in the middle of Nebraska, most people most of the time are not driving 100 miles a day, though they more may more frequently actually need to do that, in which case a car like the Volt really solves the problem. Fair enough. And on that, I think uh, I think both of our guests I know have to, to vanish. So uh, I think, Mike, you and I should um, head on. We're, we're just going to do a final story, which is an interview, isn't it, Mike? Mm. It is, yes. Uh, an interview with uh, Keith uh, Johnson, who is the European president of, of Raver. Uh, Raver uh, have been building electric cars uh, mainly for the Asian market and, and more recently for the European market for the last nine years now, and they've just been te- uh, had a, a majority uh, shareholding in Mahindra. In Mahindra, I find this very a, funny. Um, in India, car manufacturer. I, I heard a rumor about this a couple of weeks mm-hmm. ago, and I heard lots of rumors last week, and I saw lots of articles on it. And in fact, I wrote an article. Uh, for all cars electric on it, and uh, uh, I, I sent John an email in the week, uh, as my editor saying, "Someone's posted on here. What should I say?" And and they posted something. I can't remember exactly what it was, uh, John, but it was something along the lines of, "You're lying. Why are you lying?" Um, and <laughs> the the next week, it's it's happened. So I feel very vindicated. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> uh, but anyway, before we play that, uh, John, thank you for joining us today. Where can people find out more about you? www.greencarreports, that's reports with an S, dot com. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. Thank you. And, uh, My and, and, and thank you for being a, a nice editor to me as well. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh-huh. Thank you for contributing. Because I've only I've only Take been care. writing I've only been writing for one month so uh, but, but there we are. Thank you very much, John, and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Cheers. And Mark, where can people hear uh, more about you and what you get up to? Well, you can check out my blog at Plugs and Cars, written out plugsandcars.blogspot.com, and it's usually reposted over at Plug in America's blog. Um, which is available at pluginamerica.org. That's pluginamerica.org. Oops, 
pluginamerica.org. Excellent. Thanks so much, And there much, you Mark. can find out. Thank you very much, Nikki. Bye-bye. And I'll let you go and answer your telephone. Take care. See you soon. Bye. The, and then there were two, Mike. So should we go ahead and play this interview? Hmm. Here we go. We'll finish. Absolutely, I think that's a great idea. We'll finish this show off, and uh, I hope you enjoy that. Um, I'm joined now by Keith Johnson, the European President of Reva. At the end of what's been a very eventful day for the company, Keith is currently at Reva's headquarters in Bangalore, where I believe it's somewhere around ten o'clock in the evening. So thanks, Keith, for joining us so late in the day. Pleasure. Good evening, Mike. Uh, Keith, tell me what's happened today at Reva. Well, today Reva sold a majority stake to an Indian conglomerate called Mahindra and Mahindra. So a very eventful day really. Um, the reason we did it was we've over the last six months really we've been reviewing our, our growth strategy and because it looks like the electric vehicle market is about to explode and bearing in mind Reva has been in it and pioneering it for the last 15 years where progress has been really slow. We really took the decision or, or had to answer the question, how do we best seize the opportunity of this exploding market? And we decided the answer to that was that we needed the support of an established automotive manufacturer. You know, we're competing in a very large global industry against very large global companies. And um, we just didn't have sufficient resources on our own to be able to do this properly. Um, and we needed really more than just money. You know, it would have been possible for us to go out and raise additional money or, or additional debt. Um, but we really have great strengths in, in the electric vehicle technology. But in terms of competing, in terms of manufacturing, um, vehicle development and so on, we simply don't have the resources ourselves. So that was why you know, we decided to sell the majority stake. Um, I guess the, the next question probably then is why Mahindra? Um, now obviously they're a, an Indian company like Raver are. Um, there are, there were really several potential manufacturers out there that could offer us the, the vehicle development, the manufacturing, the assistance in India with the distribution. But what really made Raver choose Mahindra was, was their values. They're very similar to Ravers, although they're a large organization. Uh, they have excellent reputation for corporate governance. And what was very impressive to us was their commitment to sustainable growth. Um, it's, uh, they, they, they have such large companies, you might not realize that um, between prototypes, semi-commercialized, non-commercialized vehicles, they're in almost every segment. and they. They have CNG vehicles, hybrid vehicles. They were the first to have a hybrid in India. They have biodiesel, and they've had been developing electric three-wheelers in India for the last decade. So the acquisition of Raver for Mahindra is a very good fit, and their values fit with us very good. So this this combination, as I say, of corporate governance, the commitment to sustainable growth, and and finally, I guess their their willingness, more than their willingness, their desire to let us operate independently. Very often when a company sells a majority stake, it's absorbed into the organization, whereas here, the uh, all the officers in the company, except for the chairman, will remain the same. Um, we've been asked to complete our existing business plan to retain our entrepreneurial ways. We're not having large corporate systems or processes imposed upon us in order to keep, as I say, the entrepreneurial spirit and the passion and that whole authenticity that exists within the company. So it's a, it's a very carefully thought out plan I'm, and I hope that came across today in some of the reports, probably not in that depth. Fantastic. So what's the mood inside Reva and, and inside the factory today? Very jolly, very upbeat. We. Um, you know, we started the day with the announcement to the stock market and um, there was a board meeting and then there was the press conference which was very well attended, um, certainly in India. And then uh, we spent um, several hours with the whole company, which is uh, around 300 people. And the, um, the senior guys from Mahindra came and spoke to us, or spoke to everybody about Mahindra, about their hopes and desires and, you know, tried to 
uh, as they would to reassure everybody. But it was a, it was almost um, a party atmosphere, really. It was very jolly. I think everyone in Raver sees this as a as a very positive move. Great, that's fantastic. What does it mean for the Reaver NXR and NXG electric cars? Well, as I said, the, 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 the wish is for us to execute our existing business plan. So that means a real focus on the NXR now over the next 12 months. Um, the, the focus until now has been very much on the strategic fit between the two companies. As far as the NXR program is concerned, there'll be very soon, there'll be a formal review and we we will invite in, we will cherry pick from within the Mahindra companies the best talent we can find to come in and really get critique where we are with this program and see where they can help us either do things faster or do things better. Um, you know, that's the whole purpose of, uh, of today really. Now what, what the outcome of that will be, I don't know, you know, we will certainly listen to what they have to say so there are there are no guarantees but um, certainly as far as I can tell you today we're committed to the same program we were yesterday excellent so it's business as usual I have a question that's been asked by an existing Reva owner on the Reva car club forums they like Reva because it isn't one of the big corporations it's a small independent manufacturer with its own identity and its own character that people can relate to what have you got to say to people who say that Reva is just now going to be another big anonymous corporation like Ford or General Motors? Well, the people that started the company um, are still here. And today they still own the same shareholding as they did yesterday. Uh, the Miney family and AEV of America were the, the founders and the promoters. Um, what's happened is they have bought back the shares of our institutional investors who came on board in 2006, they invested about $20 million. They have bought back those shares today so that their shareholding remains exactly the same. So it's the same people. Um, the uh, Chaitan Maini, the, uh, the, the founder and chief technical officer, is now founder and chief strategy and technical officer. And uh, his elder brother Sandeep Maini, who has been our chairman, has stepped down as chairman. Our chair, we now have a very experienced automotive person from Mahindra, Dr. Pawan Goenka. He has stepped down, but they're both still on our board. So um, they're absolutely as involved. Um, we haven't really been a, a small company in the sense that we haven't had any external investment since 2006. So again, in that respect, I think, you know, the headlines and what's reported in the media might be a little misleading as far as it feels inside the company. We're exactly the same, but now we've got access to some fantastic resources. I mean, to tell you a little bit of, you know, about Mahindra. I, I, again, I'm not sure what's too much what's been reported, but um, they've grown. They've got a reputation for growing small, relatively small companies like ours, very successful in a in a fairly hands-off way. But um, they they're very successful. There are a hundred thousand people now. They um, span, I think it's 42 countries they have a presence in. Uh, they very strong in automotive is, is their main business and they have a vehicle in almost every segment. So, you know, there's a lot of good stuff there for us to pick, pick and choose from. That's fantastic news. Keith, thank you very much for joining me today. No, you're welcome. So there you go. That interview was recorded yesterday evening. Um, it was about 10 o'clock in the evening in uh, in India when uh, I spoke to Keith and uh, it, 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 so it had been a very, very long day for him. So right. it, was, it was fantastic to get, if you like, the, the first real uh, information from within the company, what it's like. You know, it, yeah, I think lots of positive news for everyone. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, uh, I think that's just about it for today's show. Um, and for some reason... All of my video has just vanished. Uh, so I'm not sure quite where it's gone. You, you, I went to black <laughs> and now everything's gone, Mike. So, uh, ah, enjoy technology. Where? I had everyone's, everyone set up and then it just vanished. Oh, no, that was me not being in the right mode. So there you have it. Ah. You've got my, you've got my video back. Uh, we'll be back next week, won't we, Mike? We will indeed. Same bat time, same bat channel. Um, and don't forget, you can absolutely. follow us on Twitter, twitter.com forward slash evolve transport, because transport evolved didn't fit. I'm a bit annoyed with Twitter, their, their, their limit on characters. 
Uh, transport evolved. Is one character too long? And evolved transport is the maximum you can have on Twitter. So there we are. www.twitter.com forward slash evolve transport. That is it for another week. Uh, thank you for joining us for the first proper episode next week. Uh, I not sure who we've got on next week's show, but I'm sure it will be great fun. My name is Nikki Gordon Bloomfield. And I'm Mike Boswell. And this has been Transport Evolved. And Mike told me last week I have to have a new catchphrase. I said, don't forget mm. to plug in and drive green. So well, this is a transport That's... show about more than electric cars, so it's going to have to be... We'll work on that one, I think. No, no that, that's we'll not a very good catchphrase. We'll work on it now. <laughs> we'll work on we'll work it. On. <laughs> well, that's what the whole electric vehicle industry is saying. But as you say, it's, it's about hybrids and everything else as well. <laughs> so until next time, burn less gas. Bye, folks. See you soon. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.